Hello, hello. Welcome to Faith Radio's live stream event, Love's Power to Heal. I'm Suzy Larson, host of Suzy Larson Live, heard daily on the Faith Radio Network. And if you listen often enough, you know one of our favorite guests is Dr. Troy Spurl, who joins me on the show every single month to talk about health and the healing process. Tonight, we're talking about Love's power to heal. Did you know that whether or not you live loved has physiological implications? It has spiritual implications. It really ripples into every area of our life. But even if you're actually, you are loved, but you don't believe you're loved and you live like you're not loved, that impacts your cells. What happens in your soul happens in your cells. I say that often. So tonight we want to not only convince you that you are so profoundly loved, that God sings over you with joy, that he looks upon you with amazing affection, that the, the power of believing that, of receiving that and walking in that kind of love will deeply impact not only your health, but how you show up in the world. So I want to welcome my friend, Dr. Troy Spurl, to the show because we also are going to welcome, look at, he dressed up. I'm having a bad hair day and he dressed up. It's so unfair. You couldn't have- I'm having a it. bad hair life. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're compensating by the nice suit yeah. that you're wearing. So I love that. So I want to tell you, friends, we all want to pray for you, but we also want to answer questions for you. Um, so don't be shy about uh, putting your question in the chat and then copy paste, copy paste as many times as you need to, because Dr. Troy and I were going to talk for a little bit here, just about just about the love's power to heal. There's some incredible content, incredible research really available right now for the implications of love. I mean, science is just now catching up with scripture, but scripture has declared it all along. It's not that we love God, but that He loved us. And Katie, thank you for saying. I think she's talking about you, Troy, looking sharp. I'll take that because that's the yeah. first time heard that when the two of us are together. So <laughs> yeah, I'll, right. I'll see that. yeah, well, we're usually on radio, but they're like, man, you look good. All right. So we, we ask you really uh, post your questions and we will get to them as many times as we can. Hey, Amy, so grateful to have you joining and tell us where you're watching from. That's always so fun to see as well. I want to give you an official introduction because sometimes we have friends watching online who don't know about the radio show and maybe don't know you. So let me give you a formal and proper introduction. Dr. Troy Spurl is the founder and CEO of Synapse Center for Health and Healing, located in Egan, Minnesota. He started Synapse over 26 years ago with a vision to bring an integrative approach to healthcare through functional medicine, making Synapse an internationally known center for true health. On a personal note, Dr. Troy and his wife, Christine, are great, dear friends of Kevin mine, and he really has played an integral role in my healing process. So we love and appreciate you, Doc. Thanks for joining us tonight. Well, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, I'm so looking forward to this conversation. Before we get into the whole idea of Love's Power to Heal, I do have to talk about giveaways. Kim, my one of my producers is here off to the side and my hubby's on the other side here, but Kim was saying, I can never get over how generous Synapse is. So every time we do these big events, your clinic gives away some of the most amazing gifts. Now, these two giveaways are pretty significant and you have to, you have to kind of go to the clinic to, to partake. And I was gonna say you have to be local, but you don't because some people come from all over the country to spend a week week in Minneapolis so that they can make a bunch of appointments with you. So um, I want to tell you, um, the Hockett therapy um, is a $344 value. Talk about what the Hockett is. And I I'm telling you, when we were all out to dinner once, you guys and us and some other friends, and you were joking and calling it the whole cat. Do you know how many times I've called it that now? I mean, you, it's in my long-term memory. I'm like, don't call it the whole cat. Don't call it. The <laughs> but I, anyway, Hockett, talk, us, talk to us about what that big giveaway is. Well, it, it's really a, a 10 in one. It looks like a little mini rocket ship, but it's a, it's a 10 in one therapy that uh, has all kinds of different therapies, an ozone therapy that helps kill off certain infections, uh, uh, bicarbonate therapy, which helps with uh, blood pressure. And it basically has a couple different types of sauna, steam sauna, infrared sauna. So it's a full unit. You go in there, it helps you detoxify, helps you cleanse. Uh, some uh, uh, people use it for anti-aging. Some people use it for uh, for basically just uh, detoxifying and aging better um, and, and feeling better, I should say. Mm -hmm. And so there are many, many uses for it. It's got frequency-specific uh, therapy and light therapy, which actually plays into a little bit about what we're going to be talking about tonight, which helps, uh, again, clean up different types of imbalances in the body. FSM is a frequency that can actually help with our tissue healing. So. Awesome. Uh, it's a it's a ten in one and a, a brilliant uh, unit, a great addition to to uh, what we've been using here. And so people, especially in the winter time, love it because it's mm -hmm. uh, it actually warms them up. 
So Hockett, there'll be $344 value. You're giving one of those away tonight. Talk a quick uh, moment about IV therapy. That's another pretty substantial gift. Yeah, so we do different types of IV, IVs for different conditions. Uh, specifically right now, uh, flu season, COVID season, uh, and especially for people with post-COVID uh, issues, IV glutathione has been the uh, game changer for that. So uh, we will uh, offer IV therapy for different scenarios, but that's one of the ones, one of the things we're giving away tonight. And uh, IV glutathione helps tremendously uh, with, uh, again, detox, but uh, uh, overcoming different types of uh, infections, but COVID in particular. We also have uh, IV uh, vitamin C for other types of flu and things like that. And then Myers cocktails, which is like a, a group of different uh, uh, vitamins that go right into your uh, cells and help with energy and, and uh, uh, sleep relaxation. So the IV therapy is uh, kind of circumventing the digestive system to get the nutrients right to you. And you get mm -hmm. to sit in the room and um, uh, people tend to enjoy it because uh, you get to actually talk with our nurses. And if Mary's in the room, she will pray with you and over you. And, uh, and people tend to love that. So uh, she's like a missionary sure. nurse in the clinic. You know, she has a missionary heart. So she if you get a chance to meet her, I did three Myers cocktails during COVID while I was fighting COVID. And uh, it, it I could tell it kicked it helped kick yeah. it out of me. So fantastic. And then there's two gift boxes from Faith Radio. And it's a combination of some fun uh, love decor from Hobby Lobby, some books, a journal. Uh, scripture postcards and that kind of thing. So two of those. So I don't want you to feel like it's first come, first serve. We're going to keep posting the link in to, um, to register to win, but you've got to, we're not going to even make the drawing till next Tuesday, the 15th. So it's not first come, first serve. So enjoy the broadcast and then hop on the link after and register to win and, and, and specify which thing that you're going for. And I pray that you win. So, okay. I want to talk about, you know, I mentioned this a couple of years ago when you and I did a, an event on on the power of love to heal the body. Uh, Danielle Strickland, she's an activist. She's done all kinds of work with human trafficking and those who battle drug addiction. She's really a brilliant uh, mind in the Christian space. And she talked about a neuroscientist who put, who looked at the MRIs of people who were in love. And they noticed three areas of the brain light up just consistently for anybody who was in love. The first one was the joy center, that's that center of pleasure. And, you know, in the, the joy center, even for a child, when a baby sees its parent and it like it fires up that joy center. So it's not just two people that are in love. It's a sense of love, this joy that gets awakened. And the other is when we're talking about love, love, you know, is is a risk. There's a willingness. But I would say that would be the case, too, if with a child. You will throw yourself in front of a bus for a child. You know, I mean, there's a, there's a sense of risk. And then the third one is attachment. And so she was saying, you know, these are the three things that light up in our brain when we are loved and when we love. And so she said, so if you were to put God under an MRI, you would see his brain on fire because he is so, so profoundly, he, he sings over you. He's so full of joy. He took a great risk. He sent his one and only son to die and he's profoundly attached to us. And so then her question was after that, what would happen if your brain was under the MRI? And I'm talking specifically connected to your awareness of God's love. Is there joy or is there dullness? You know, is there risk or is there self-preservation? Is there attachment or is there isolation? And I just think, let's start there, Doc, because when we um, detach and isolate, we've forgotten that we loved. When we are operating in self-preservation, we're operating in fear, not love. And when there's not a sense of joy and pleasure in our life, we've lost sight that we've got a happy God that loves us so much. So maybe take it from there and unpack that a bit. Jumps uh -oh, out. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, you, um, you okay? Yeah, the first yeah. thing that really uh, jumps out is the uh, light of the MRI. When you say the MRI just lights up, uh, I, I think about what God uh, would bring and the whole thing would just be light. It would just like flood everything. So. It's very important to, to recognize that uh, in our life, when we get disconnected from different areas like that, uh, we can easily get away from joy. And uh, even today, I was working with uh, a patient and uh, we were working through some past uh, trials and, and tribulations and some just you know traumas, some deep, deep traumas. And we got to a place where it's now important for her to start focusing on joy. 
and what brings joy to her uh, life and what is joy of the Lord? What does that mean for her? And uh, it's important for all of us to really get to that point and do an honest check in and say, where are we with that? Because you'll find out it's so easy to just slide into a, a state of of lack of joy, a state of depression, to accept the spirit of heaviness uh, on us and not cast that out, not rebuke that. And so it's so important to uh, bring that uh, into our uh, everyday uh, life consciously. Uh, we have to do that. Also, when it comes to just um, um, the spirit of fear and casting that out as well, we need to uh, get to a point where we understand that uh, that life has happened and there are bad things that do happen. And if we stay with the within the thoughts of those bad things and we just live in that state, it's like living in the darkness of the valley uh, all the time. You have to seek the light. You have to seek God to help pull you out of that darkness. And that can be quite a journey uh, to, to do. It's not the easiest thing in the world. It does take an act of faith. It does take an action step. It takes a choice and we have free will to do that. And so it's important to know that when you start operating away from that fear, that's when you see the risk components start to come in. And I'm going to say it slightly differently. It's a vulnerability. We have to be, uh, uh, to a certain degree, vulnerable to get the reward that is waiting for us when we talk about receiving God's love. It, there, there, uh, there is a vulnerability there. That's true for our spouses too. If you have a wall up all the time, you're not going to receive the love. You're not going to get to experience it. So risk is important. But when people have been hurt, the last thing you want to do is take a risk. And so there, there's an uncomfortableness that we have to get comfortable with in order to receive God's love, in order to receive love from our community. And it's very, very important that we be in community and receive that love. Amen. As you're talking, I'm thinking, you know, we have this thing, this practice we did with our boys when they were growing up. And now that they're all married, we still do it. The wives have jumped right in, but we go around and whoever's birthday it is, we just speak a blessing and an affirmation going, this is what I see in you, or this is what I've seen you overcome this last year. And one of my daughters-in-law said to one of the others, she says, you have a gift, an amazing gift of hospitality. And that is obviously true. She's a great cook. She just, she does it up when people come over, but she goes, and I don't mean just on the surface level. She goes, I'm talking about hospitality and that you have space in your heart for others. And I was rocked by that. And I just thought hospitality at that level, having space in our heart, not only to love, but to be loved. Going back to what you say, Doc, and when you think about, I mean, what a great inventory in our hearts. And friends, I want to just ask you to take inventory and think about that. There's my pit bull. Never mind him in the background. It's like Wizard of Oz. Pay no attention to the pit bull with the underbite. <laughs> anyway. Um, if we all just took inventory, and I think it might be even a good thing on a weekly basis, maybe on your Sabbath, but the first thing to say, what is my joy level, you know, and, and then, you know, how, how, what risk is God inviting me to join him in? Because there's an adventure to that. And when we trust him, right. And then how, how is my attachment to him deepening and even my attachment to a healthy attachment to community? Because let's just talk for just a minute about the enemies. I mean, when you think of the enemy's attempt to thwart our sense of being loved, if he can cut off our sense of joy, if he can interrupt our, our desire to live an adventurous life, if he can just shut down our sense of attachment, look what happened. Well, we're seeing it in our culture, yeah. you know? We're not joyful, we're full of despair. We are yeah. not taking risks. We are self-preserving to the point of hurting others. You know, we are not feeling attached, we're feeling detached. And in our detachment, then we can justify writing people off. And so his plan, and you know, seems to be working fairly well. But whenever I talk with you, I feel like you have this unbelievable optimism about, about the faithfulness of God, but also about, about his people, that if we continue to just cultivate hearts of love and keep walking in faith and keep dealing with our stuff, we will be initiators of joy and attachment and adventurous risk. And I remember you said a couple of weeks ago, you said, I've never worked so hard. I've never felt so much stress and I've never felt so alive in my whole life. And I'm yeah. like, somebody give me an amen because that's the times we're in. What do you say? 
Yeah, it's it's the season we're in right now, and so mm -hmm. uh, and when you're in a season like this, uh, you can make some bad choices and go into the darkness of the shadows and just sit and and talk about and experience how awful things are, or you can dig your heels in and work against the enemy. Uh, and just focus on God. And uh, the enemy does not create, the enemy perverts. And so uh, that is a big, big component of what's happening right now. And God has created us in his image and that created us to love. And we can love and we can experience love. But when there's a breakdown in communication, when there's a breakdown in communication between community, between us and God, the more Satan has us focused on everything but God, the more we stop communicating. And that's what's happening and so as we as we experience that i i'm just going to say this my optimism comes from two two places i know where i'm going i know how great heaven's going to be i know i'm going to experience a love i have never experienced before and it's just going to be all consuming and just the glory flowing all over me i just imagine that all the time and i think that's fantastic and then i wake up and i've got 16 hours of work to do mm -hmm. <laughs> with that I also see and I know that God's not done right now. We're in a season right now, and I 100% has been put on my heart that we're about to see something that we have never seen in our lifetime before. Yeah. We're about to see something that's just going to make people recognize who God is and how he is real. And it's not just a fake thing. And people go to church and they're, they become robots with, with the routine and they're about to see the God of miracles. They're about to see the God who just performs and is there for us. They're about to see God work live in an action through people, on people. And I just think you're going to see all kinds of miracles and all kinds of blessings. And what's coming out of this is just going to be miraculous. So I was going to say, somebody got to give me an amen, but I already got some amens. They're overachievers. I didn't even have to ask for it. And they gave me some amens. And I believe that with everything in me. Dr. Kurt Thompson is, uh, I want to say, a psychopharmacologist and neuropsychiatrist. I mean, he's just a you know, brilliant guy. We've had him on the show a few times, but one of the things that he says to do actually three things to help the world heal and it helps our own souls heal. And I just love it. And I want to throw it out because someone needs it. But one is to, to regularly put yourself in the path of beauty, regularly put yourself in the path of beauty. And I just finished a coaching group of 12 women and that was their assignment every day to put yourself in the path of beauty. Then every week, create something, you know, bake some cookies or paint a picture, write a song, you know, do something like that, create something. And then once a week, share your gift with someone else. And he says, this will help the world heal. And, and, you know, I know you and I both, you know, we are so passionate about the healing process, not only to take place in us, but through us. So why don't you just say a word, if you would, about truly the scientific physiological implications of knowing you're loved or being loved and not believing your love. Talk about just sort of the, you know, the distinction between the two impacts on our health. Well, you said something really important there because you can uh, know you're loved, but not experience love because you're not receiving it. And so we, again, have, have free will. And it's so important. We have to set ourselves in an environment that can nurture love and, and have us receive it. That's great. But you actively have to receive it. And a lot of times... Um, we have trauma in our life or life has not gone how we thought it would, or we've been so imperfect with our life that we don't feel worthy of receiving that love. So we're the ones that put up the block for that love. So it's important to know that, uh, that you are worthy of being loved. God chose you and God chooses to love you. And so that's a very important component you're worthy of his love. We're also uh, very much imperfect and uh, full of sin nature, but that that gets cleansed. When we accept Jesus and we go to heaven, that is wiped clean. We are cleansed and that should just offer so much more gratitude for you. And so receiving that love is very important because I have so many people who actually come in and they have the self-condemning thoughts. They have uh, a worthiness issue where they have believed a lie. They have believed a lie that they thought themselves at some point or someone told them and they accepted and received that. So generally speaking, you have to identify the lie, rebuke the lie, give it back, surrender that to God. Let God, uh, let yourself be open to receiving what God has for you. And that's when you can start the process uh, of healing. And I'm going to say one other thing. 
I, I love the brain. I study the brain a lot. And there is a lot of, um, a lot of things that influence our brain, all types of pharmaceuticals, uh, chemicals that are made and they bind to receptors on our cells in our brain. Now I want you to really hear this because there are pharmacies that have billions of dollars of profits to make a, a product that binds to a receptor. Now ask yourself, why is that receptor there? It's because God has already created a chemical that naturally binds to that receptor. So how do you go about in your daily walk to help create those chemicals? What we're finding with science are the things like prayer and joy and gratitude and laughing uh, can help to make and create those chemicals. I love what uh, you said with uh, um, the women going and creating. The act of creating, that's from God. God is a creator. Uh, Satan is not a creator. Satan is a perverter. So we don't, we don't go down that lane. We go down the creation lane. And when you do that and you have joy at what you just created, you're releasing chemicals that actually are binding to your receptors that help with the healing process. You have a billion dollar pharmacy within you. You just have to help release the natural, innate, God given chemicals that will help you get to the next step in healing. And that is the problem of treating only treating symptoms, where we want to just not feel discomfort. And, and so we want to get through the moment and not feel discomfort. But if we were willing to maybe take the long road to go, Lord, what am I trying hard not to feel? Because he might say, you know what, I want you to free up your schedule. I want you to take the long way to church, drive at the country road and put the music on, you know, I want you to dance a little bit or cook. I mean, I remember you said uh, on one of the shows a long time ago, but that, you know, we just even fast tracking our meals is detrimental to our health because we need to smell the food that we're cooking so that our bodies kick in and get ready to rest and digest. And we're, we're fearfully and wonderfully made to follow at the pace of grace. And Alan Fadling said, since we follow an unhurried savior, what should the pace of our life be? And I just think that if, if we can revolt against the rat race, against the hatred and the isolation and the fear mongering and the self-preservation and think, you know what? God has a bigger shovel. He is generous. I'm going to live generously. And if I get hurt in the process, God will heal me and redeem me. But if we could become flow through accounts of God's blessing and his love and his generosity, we'd actually start to help the world heal. And you and I, in our prep, we're talking and you brought brought this up when I was talking about the joy, the risk and the attachment that, you know, the old song looking for love in all the wrong places, that these are temporarily found. I mean, if, if we're looking for love in the wrong place and you find a temporary high, like all of a sudden you just start drinking a ton or shopping a ton or porn or whatever your thing is, you may in the short run feel a surge of pleasure or what you think is joy, you may feel you're taking risks, you know, yeah. and you may feel a strong attachment. And so we must not mistake the, the, the kind of uh, these aspects of love that are actually healing to the soul. And what you said, I thought was amazing. You said, there's not a rebound effect to God's love. So take it from there. Yeah. The difference is uh, that you have to be able to discern. And so anything that uh, has a rebound to it, like I'll use the example of people who overconsume caffeine. If you consume a lot of caffeine in whatever form, and then you stop caffeine and you get a headache, that's called a rebound headache. If you are doing something um, that brings you joy, and I'm going to use uh, an example here because I'm seeing this weekly, but kids, young kids playing excess amount of games are actually having a rebound or withdrawal from stopping playing the games. That means it's being done in excess and there's consequences that, that are happening. And so uh, it's very, very important to understand that if there's a rebound or withdrawal component uh, from it in a negative way, then that's, that's different than God's love. You don't have a rebound effect when you have God's God's love. Uh, it's, it's something that is more permanent. There's dimensions to it. There's layers to it. There's depth to it. Uh, it's completely different. It's not shallow. Eventually, when you are uh, doing something that's temporarily giving some joy, it will stop. There will be no, there's a limit. All of a sudden it stops bringing that joy. When it's 
just releasing dopamine and you get a little excitement, it's going to eventually stop doing that uh, as well. And so with God's love, it never stops. So it'll keep on going. And so there is no rebound for it. There is no ceiling to it. So there, there's a big difference mm-hmm. there. And discernment is really, really important. And so many youth right now are misinterpreting. They're trying to get that quick that quick fix, if you will, uh, to, to bring just a little bit of pleasure, a little bit of of uh, joy, but then uh, it starts to fade. And so they're looking for the next thing and the next thing, and all of a sudden they can't find it. And then they crash and we see a pretty significant anxiety or depression that comes with that. Hmm. Yeah. That's the law of diminishing returns, right? I mean, after a while, it takes more to get a less effect and more and then less. And before you know it, you're held captive. And again, you know, I mean, I'm not, I don't mean to say that there's like a demon behind every bush, but I kind of think there's two demons behind every bush. I mean, his aim is to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I come that you have life and life abundantly. And I believe that that life is in the land of the living. I think there's so much more waiting for us in heaven. But we are not going to just endure and try to survive. We're going to see his goodness in the land of the living. We're going to learn to thrive in this place. And I think that's why you and I are so constantly pounding this whole idea that every step towards healing matters. And if you can take the risk to believe that God wants you at his party. You know, if you can take the risk to believe you're someone he loves and dare to stand in it, even if it doesn't feel true, things will start to change in your physiology, won't they? I mean, your cells will start to open up. I mean, how you receive nutrients, it actually. Yeah, the nutrients, the blood flow, uh, all that starts to open up. And, And if we're focusing on healing, healing just helps us to become less distracted because we have less things breaking down the communication. When you have less distractions and you know what to focus on and and who to focus on, then that that's that's all God wants. He just wants us to praise him, to worship him and and to recognize that uh, that he's God and that he sent his only son for us. And so we get anything that breaks down communication will cause us to potentially be disconnected from God. And so our health is one of the main, main ways that that happens. And then some people will try and, uh, and this is not a slam against the pharmaceutical community because they can save lives quite a bit. But if you're replacing your ill health with a, a toned down version of yourself because you're just numbing something in a different way, then that's also a win for Satan in a lot of ways. Now, that's not saying get off life-saving medications or anything like that. I, I'm not against meds at all. But when there's a root cause that we can look at physically, mentally, chemically, or spiritually, we go after it so that you can be the best version of you uh, so that you are ready when you're called. And yeah. so that's a big part of what we're talking about. And one of the reasons why I really focus on helping people as much as I can uh, find the root cause because of how much that can interfere with just the best version of you. And, and we are meant to take care of our temple. And and there is an attack on that. There, there's been uh, changes in our food supply. There's been, there's been uh, specific things that are meant to divide us, not bring us together. And so I see it becoming so obvious right now that it's starting to have the opposite effect and people are starting to come together because of that. They're sick mm-hmm. and tired of the division. Right. And I love it. I Me love too. it. Yeah. The devil has overplayed his hand, you know, and, you know, to make it, to maybe make it applicable again, to go back to the idea of the three areas of your brain that light up under an MRI when you're fit, when you're loved and when you love is joy is uh, what did I say? Attachment or risk, and then a sense of attachment. So what if you just start to take inventory and say, Lord, you know, the joy of the Lord is my strength, increase my capacity to know your love. Because in Ephesians, it says to know this love is to be filled with the fullness of God. So increase my capacity to know your love, that I might know your joy as well. And then also, God, what kind of faith risk do you want me to take this week? And then start to engage. I'm telling you, you'll start to come alive. And then, Lord, deepen my attachment to you and let me sense how strongly you're attached to me. You've tethered yourself to me. And then who can I um, connect with, maybe pursue or reach out to? I think those right there just sort of fly in the face of the enemy's desire for us to isolate, for us to self-preserve, and for us to despair. I mean, I just say, let's, let's fight back, you know, and I think that's a great way to do it. Um, Before I want to talk about trauma and how that gets in the way of knowing we're loved. And even on forgiveness, our good friend, Karna Ching texted and said, don't forget 
to talk about unforgiveness. And she's absolutely right about that. Before we do that, though, I want to just give a quick heads up again. If you're brand new to Faith Radio, we are a radio network, which is just amazing. We have amazing, amazing programs. MyFaithRadio.com is a website. If you're new to our YouTube channel, make sure that you hit subscribe below. Click that little bell or like button or whatever that is. I'm so versed. The bell. And you won't miss any upcoming. I'm sorry. I'm such a piece of work. And then for the giveaways, a big thanks, a shout out to Dr. Troy's Clinic Center. Center for Health and Healing. They're giving away almost $700 of the gifts, two gifts, an IV therapy and a Hocket therapy. And Faith Radio is also giving away a couple of really fun uh, gift bags. So you have a few days to register for those. And if you do, if you miss the link here, it's myfaithradio.com slash giveaway and you register to win and we will draw those winners on the 15th. So let's talk for a moment and friends start uh, posting your questions because we have a few more things we want to chat about here and then we want to tackle your questions. All right. So we'd love to hear from you. Uh, oh, and if you're brand new to the Faith Radio family, I'm so sorry. I forgot to tell you this. We want to send you a free welcome packet and we've got just an amazing thing going on at Faith Radio. It's like there's a revival breaking out at Faith Radio. I mean, the growth, oops, there goes my earpiece. The growth growth, the ministry, the fruit. We are just hearing testimonies of changed lives and we would love for you to be part of our family. We would love to get you a great little welcome, you know, gift bag there. So that information is also in the chat. Okay. So start handing in or posting your questions if we can answer those. And doc, let's talk now then about trauma. Um, it's a general market book, not a Christian book, but it's by Dr. Van der Kolk, I think his name is. I hope I didn't lose him just now, but it's called The Body Keeps Score. And one of yeah. the things that he said in that book was that when you experience trauma, the world is experienced through a different nervous system. So while everybody else is showing up for life and having a present experience, like being present in the moment, enjoying the laughter, whatever, the person with trauma, their bodies are so busy suppressing the inner chaos that they're only partially there. That just is heartbreaking when you think, and, and everybody has trauma to some degree. Some have massive trauma, some, you know, and there's two types of trauma, the kind of stuff that happens to you that should never happen to you, and the stuff that didn't happen for you that should have happened for you. Um, but talk about how trauma really stands in the way of, of b believing that you're the object of God's affection. Yeah, so trauma, uh, and we this can be physical trauma, and this can be mental trauma, or emotional trauma. Uh, when we have trauma, there are different things that happen in the body. The body will physically start to shut down to help save you from the trauma. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually a brilliant mechanism, but the reality is your system just starts to shut down. And so uh, there's a couple of different ways we can actually uh, look at this, but one of the things I like to point out is just what happens just specifically with the thyroid. Now, this is just one component of the body. But when you have trauma, the thyroid will stop converting the inactive thyroid called T4 to the active thyroid called T3. Instead, it starts producing what's called reverse T3. Reverse T3's job is to bind to the receptors to block T3 the whole point being so that your metabolism shuts down and on key areas of the body. So all of your energy and, and uh, life force, if you will, can go to fixing the traumatic area. Now that works brilliantly when you are in an accident and you're bleeding out. And so all you're not using up energy on wasted um, uh, mechanics somewhere else in the body. And so uh, that's, that's great. But if you have these micro traumas, all, day long, emotionally, stress-wise, you can slowly, consistently start to actually build up this reverse T3 and unknowingly shut down your system. And so we see that all the time. We'll do lab work and, and run that test. And when you see that repeat uh, reverse T3 that's elevated uh, in the absence of physical trauma, then we know we're dealing with some other chemical or emotional traumas that are impacting that. With trauma, we also see the cells start to fold over on themselves. So the little receptors on the membrane get covered up mm -hmm. and that end is to protect itself. And those receptors can't accept the nutrients as efficiently. And so we end up seeing a complete uh, shutdown of our uh, cells ability to accept the nutrients that help to power it and to help communicate to other cells. So in essence, it's another way where we see a breakdown in communication, which leads to dysfunction 
which will lead to a diseased relationship somewhere, whether it be uh, physically, personally with other people or with God. And so we're not meant really to have sustained multiple traumas, boom, 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 all the yeah. time. And but that yet yeah, that's what's happening nowadays. The more we progress into these stressful lifestyles and uh, we allow our minds to become part of the mechanism of inducing stress, you're really promoting a traumatic scenario that's shutting down your system continually. Wow. And this question, uh, Rebecca says, does that mean that trauma can affect our digestive system and ability to process food properly? I'm no doctor, but I play one on radio and I would say yes. And what do you say, Dr. Troy? <laughs> I say uh, as a second opinion, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and maybe yeah, when we're in fight or flight, we can't be in rest and digest. So fight or flight uh, is common with trauma. So again, if you're in fight or flight and you're running from a tiger or um, a tiger's chasing you, something like that, it's an awful time to sit down and take a nap or eat lunch. So our part of our brain stops supporting that system. That's why acute severe stress will cause an ulcer. An ulcer is nothing more than your nerves stopping supporting the muscle that is the stomach. And so we end up with this imbalance with the muscle itself and the amount of uh, acid that's released and we get ulcers. We also get leaky gut from chronic stress. So uh, trauma will impact stress. And we know too, physical trauma will impact leaky gut. Concussions, car accidents have induced leaky gut within 24 hours. Wow. And, and one of your docs said, I, I, he might've said 100% of the time, I don't remember, he said this a few years ago, but that almost always you can draw a straight line from a concussion to leaky gut. Is that, yeah. I mean, yeah, yes. wow. Like if you have a head injury, you're most likely gonna have leaky gut. Yes. Is that, okay, you know, this yeah. is also really interesting is, you know, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. And this to me is fascinating. If you are living, if you're sympathetic dominant. And so, you know, it's, uh, I was at your clinic and doing one of the heart tests and that, you know, your doctor said you have, your heart is in better shape than 86% of people your age. But she says your parasympathetic is flatlined. There's like no activity. And so yeah. the sympathetic is fight, flight, parasympathetic, rest and digest. And I know I move fast and all that stuff, but it really wasn't that because I stop and take deep breaths on the hour. I do deep stretching. I do everything that you can imagine. But uh, Dr. Jill, another one of my doctor friends said, I have such severe TMJ. She says, when the jaw is off, it can force sympathetic dominance. And I'm just saying, that's just one of many scenarios where you can feel like, I feel like I'm managing my stress. You know, I take deep breaths. I go to bed early. I do Epsom salt baths. You're doing everything you know to do. And you still feel like your body is like, like the foot is on the gas pedal. And I used to tell Kev, I'm like, I can't get my body to settle down. And when, what happens, what are other reasons you're, you're sympathetic dominant? And what happens when you're not balancing with your parasympathetic nervous system? So other causes of sympathetic dominance, one of the sneaky ones is copper toxicity. So oh. people who have too much copper or not enough zinc, um, and the harsh reality is that you need good stomach acid to absorb zinc. So a lot of people will have like a traumatic scenario where they have a car accident or have battled some type of um, crisis within their, their relationship, their marriage, or an infection like, uh, like mold, Lyme, and other uh, Epstein-Barr virus and other uh, serious infections. And that'll be uh, causing a, a dramatic uh, impact on the body stress-wise, and then the stomach acid can actually decrease and you don't uh, absorb as much zinc. And then you see uh, co-infections and other problems with that as well. Hmm. So there, there is a lot of other causes. Sleep disorders is one of the big ones that set up a sympathetic dominance over uh, parasympathetic. Um, uh, food sensitivities, allergies, heavy metals, infections also can trigger that and cause that. Uh, seasonal allergies. And so there are, there are other factors. Uh, it does take a lot of um, uh, time and uh, uh, energy sometimes and focus to actually identify what it is for each individual. But I like to start with uh, doing your best to fix the sleep and the gut uh, in those two areas uh, to help more than anything for, for most people. 
Hmm. I found, and I I'm, don't ask me the brand because I'm not supposed to say brands on here, but I did find an essential oil that works on the parasympathetic and you put it behind your ears before bed and before you eat. And I literally do feel a difference. It's not the, it's not, it's a puzzle piece, but it's such detective work, yeah. isn't it? But this is why, you know, we just need to go on. It's worth it. You're worth it. So to find, Lord, help me find the balance, help me to find the whys behind the what's. And uh, so, okay. So we talked about trauma. We talked about sympathetic dominance and, the, you know, the, we're just, touching on these things. We could literally do whole shows on these and maybe someday we will, but you could even do a little searching and research on your own. And I pray God helps you, you know, to get to the bottom. But I think the things you can do if you're sympathetic dominant, where you feel like you're constantly in fight flight is the deep breathing is the Epsom salt baths, right? I mean, deep breathing is so fantastic and deep stretching and some of those just physiological, you know, engagements with your body to help bring things down. Anything else that they can do just even at home to kind of give themselves a get, I was going to say a fighting chance, but we want you out of fight flight, but yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, physical exercise actually helps. So if you're if you're having a fight or flight response, your body, uh, your brain is thinking you're running from a tiger, so you might as well run a little bit. Okay. To burn it up. So uh, um, that's one thing. The other thing is uh, again addressing uh, the ability to sleep. So if you have any type of neck tension, if you have any type of jaw issues, if you have teeth infections, these are things that can sneak in there and cause disruption with your ability to get into to deep sleep. And there's all kinds of sleep disorders. Stanford has identified 102 different sleep disorders uh, that are diagnosable, but most people only know five or six. And there, there are sleep apnea, but there's also thin person sleep apnea and upper airway resistance syndrome, all kinds of different things that can impact our ability to get into a deep restorative sleep. So that's, that's a big one. Also, an under for those who overeat, uh, that can be a problem uh, for a lot of people for fight or flight. And so therefore fasting works well. For some people who under eat and their blood sugar drops too low, you can't fast and you have to eat small meals more consistently because when your blood sugar drops too low, that is a stress response as well. So like you said, we're all unique individuals and we're actually all, you know, like a 10,000 piece puzzle, but it's a different puzzle. So you've mm -hmm. got to find pieces that work for you. And I don't care if the research says 99.99% of people respond positively to this. If you're the 0 0.001 person, then that's what you should know. That's the one thing you should know about you. So you have to have awareness, insight, and discernment for what works for you. And most of what really what uh, uh, my job and our job is here is to help people understand what are the tools in their toolbox that's going to work for them? What do their puzzle pieces look like? Some people can handle dairy and corn and wheat, and some people can't. Some people have sensitivities to onion and garlic and apple. And so uh, it can be different for everyone. It depends upon your environment that you live in, the environment you grew up in, the people around you. Uh, there's even interesting studies of if you have a baby in the hospital, the the microbiome of the nurse who took care of you can influence your health when it comes to the microbiome of the baby. And so anyone who handles the, that baby early on, it becomes a, a, a part of it. So for us, we start with ourselves. We start working on healing ourselves. We bring together small community that then starts working on a healthy community that way. And then we start seeing bigger healthier communities. And when the community at large is out of fight or flight, then that will help us stay in rest and digest. Because right now, mm -hmm. the news helps induce fight or flight. Going to church and hearing the word of God helps with rest and digest, if it's a good word. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And I also heard that that we are to be in the sympathetic uh, state 80 percent of the day. Think about it. Sympath you're supposed to be in, I mean, parasympathetic, forgive me. Yeah. So yeah. we are we tend to be in sympathetic 80 percent of the day, but we're supposed to be in parasympathetic or rest and digest 80 percent of our day. And yes. I think I think we're so used to keeping the pedal to the metal that we're even worried about getting in rest and digest. But if you are in that fight flight, you actually physically feel better 
if you can get into rest and digest during the day. It doesn't make you have less energy. It gives you more clarity. And uh, that's so important. So uh, have hope. And friends, I want you to make sure that you, you really reject any notion that there's something wrong with you because there's some things that are wrong with you because we all have things that are wrong, but and we're also fearfully and wonderfully made. And so we need to be able to say, um, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made how well my soul knows it. You know, there's things you can eat things you can't. Some of you need to get to bed by 8, 30, 9 p.m. The rest of you might need to sleep in till 8 a.m. I mean, we're all so different and God loves how he made you. So embrace that and just embrace the fact that your healing path is going to look different than others. And don't come under condemnation because you have different kind of nuanced needs. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. And I'm just so praying that God would give you a vision for what a healed, healthy you might look like a year from now. And Dr. Troy joins me on the show every month. And we are just, we could have him on every week because we're just like so passionate about helping you know that every step towards healing matters. And there's so many of these steps you can even start taking right now. And one of the things, Doc, that you said one of the times before when we were talking about love was you said science falls short of grasping agape love, the kind of love that not only heals us, but also saves us. Science falls short of agape love, the kind of love that not only heals us, but the love that also saves us. Speak to that in conjunction with what Karna asked us to talk about, and that's unforgiveness. Yeah, so <clears throat> the thing about science is um, there is a, uh, and I'm going to say this, I have two filters in my life and in my career, my faith filter and my science filter. And so I'll draw from both. My faith filter uh, is my main filter. And so it's my top filter. Um, having said that, it's only because I recognize the, the uh, imperfections within science. Science tries to measure love uh, in, in a way, in a chemical way. And it's so surface there, it doesn't capture the depths of love. And so love is, I'm going to give you an example. If you, if you, if you're with a spouse and you're with that spouse, it's not just the good times. It's the bad times that help you to feel a deeper love for that spouse. It's coming through that darkness and into a different place years later and having the, all those trials and tribulations. That's a part of the love conversation. So there, it's much more depth to it than just a surface, this chemical or this chemical, which their science is trying to measure. Hmm. And I, I want to come back to that, but I, you know, this, these uh, comments kind of whipped through kind of fast and I don't want to miss this because I'm feeling like maybe we got misunderstood. Kimberly says, I'm sitting here watching with someone else and we wanted you to unpack what you meant by physical healing was guaranteed if I were closer enough to God. I have known towers of faith that died of cancer, COVID, diabetes, complications, accidents, and more. They were prayed for. Warriors in prayer had close relationship with God. Please unpack what you meant. And first of all, I, I, I can't even tell you how often I say heroes of the faith die and they're not lacking faith. So I didn't say that unless I, I, I did, I trying to imagine what I said that sounded like that, but I'm super passionate about it. I believe that as we lean in in faith, we're going to see more miracles, but there is a plus B does not always equal C with health and the healing process. I too know towers and heroes of the faith who were so godly and they died and they were not lacking faith. And I submit that there's a mystery to God and his ways and why one gets healed and the other doesn't. But I would say that faith changes us. You know, if you have a choice between faith and despair, faith is better for your soul and it's not name it claim it and it's not even faith in an outcome it's faith in a god who knows what's best for us and as we lean in and we stay connected to him we trust him i will just say i i thought like a sick person for so long and when the lord said i would heal you today but you'd lose it tomorrow you think like a sick person that was just true because i had an infrastructure for sickness i just i might with lyme disease symptoms are all over the place and so i'd be like oh that oh that and i i just it was so stressful for me that when i started to go you know there's more right with my body than wrong with my body as far as you know i have a heart that beats strong in my chest and i have circulation my blood courses through my veins and i started to thank god for what was right and i i telling you i felt like i came into a new level of health because you can think yourself sick 
I'm not saying every sick person thought themselves there, but you could have something that's this wrong and you could obsess about it and it could become something that's this wrong. So I would say, yes, faith does matter and our perspective matters and gratitude matters. Um, all those things matter, but I, I, I would have to go back and watch what you're talking about, because I can't ever even imagine saying physical healing is guaranteed if I were closer. I don't believe that. So I'm not no. sure what you heard, but Dr. Troy, can you think of if there's something you said that I think I would adjust, I know you don't feel that way either. So I'm, no. I'm not sure. No. Yeah, I, I think it might've been just something else, but uh, there, what I can say is this, there's a, there's a time for all of us. And uh, I will say this, um, I have seen, um, people that uh, should not have died um, uh, that did. And I have seen people that uh, were, my wife even worked at the hospital, was pronounced, had a patient that was pronounced dead and they were walking out of the room after cleaning it up and he sat up and asked for a Pepsi. <laughs> and so uh, that, it was not his time. And so it doesn't matter how good a doctor you are or anything else. And it's not de de dependent on your level of faith. I think maybe it's when we're talking about how um, when Satan perverts things and, and we get sick, it can keep us away from God. And so it might have been just about the, the statement about just being, being ready uh, uh, for God. When God takes us and we're ready, that it's not a bad thing. The, the people who suffer are the ones on earth because the, the, the person who, who dies of cancer and didn't have their cancer healed, their story and testimony wasn't uh, to show or prove God's miracle. It's a different story. You'll find out in heaven. So that, yeah, we're, neither one of us actually feel that way. So I just think it was uh, uh, something we said was taken a, a different way, but it, I do want to encourage people to um, uh, continue to work on uh, their relationship with uh, themselves as far as healing as much as possible so that they can stay connected to God. But mm -hmm. uh, I also know that people, when it's your time, it is your time. Yeah. And, you know, and maybe I said something I'm trying to think, you know, I do believe that the more intimately we walk with God, uh, the greater our capacity to know healing because it's his love that changes everything. And I think if we keep our distance from God, if we blame God, I mean, I've been in times and seasons when my health challenges were such that I felt disappointed in God. I felt hurt and I had to reconcile those things because I'm like, you could, why won't you? And I had to sort all those things out. But when I would put God on, in his rightful place in my life, when I would surrender and say, you are God and I am not, and I would draw near to him, he would always draw near to me. And then a little something in me would get healed. And so I just think the kind of soul healing that we need, we can't earn, we can't pay for, we can't jump high enough to get. In fact, I would uh, suggest um, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you've heard it for by grace, we are saved through faith, not of ourselves as a gift of God, not a result of works. So no man can boast. Well, the word saved actually is sozo. And it means, uh, and it, one of the things it means is saved from eternal penalty and judgment, but it also means to be made whole, to be made well, to be healed and to be restored. And I remember one day the Lord whispered to my heart, Susie, you get a healthy life by stewardship. You get a healed life by faith. And as far as the, st the kind of healing that I needed, I needed to lean in in faith and go, there's trauma in me that I can't get out of me. I'm processing, I'm counseling, I'm doing everything I know to do, but it's so embedded in my it's like imprinted on my cellular blueprint, but God, I know you can. And so by faith, I'm going to walk with you and step by step, you're going to show me and help me to put one foot in front of the other on the path of healing. And so, yes, I think the, the nearer you draw to him, um, the greater levels of healing you're going to experience because he is love and he is healing. And I mean, knowing the healer, you know, I mean, Wow. I mean, to walk intimately with God like that, something in you does get healed. But there's no indictment to say if you're not healed, you're not close enough to God. If you I, I'm, I just got to say, <laughs> you don't know me if you think that, because I just I'm so I feel like I'm passionately in defense of that kind of theology because I've had it thrust at me so many yeah. times. So enough said. So, yeah. All right. Talk oh. about un unforgiveness. Oh, did you want to yeah. add? Go ahead. No, no, with unforgiveness, um, uh, it that there are consequences that we see too, specifically with unforgiveness, and uh, uh, we see a lot of um, physical consequences. So, for example, 
Uh, and this is not true for everyone who has arthritis or everyone who has fibromyalgia, but there are a lot of times when someone comes in with uh, unforgiveness uh, uh, as the part of their story, then uh, we work on that because uh, forgiving is uh, going to promote more of a healing process. And we've seen instant turnarounds with uh, arthritis and, and other pain syndromes like fibromyalgia when it's identified. And sometimes people don't even know uh, that who they have to forgive. And sometimes it's themselves. So my question usually is, um, does God love us? And does God forgive us? And uh, if the answer is yes, which the answer is yes, then uh, it's important for us to not get in the way of what God would do for us. And so what are the consequences of the unforgiveness? There's physical consequences to the body when we don't forgive others. And think about what we were talking about earlier about just uh, some of the, the disconnect, some of the division that we see. Unforgiveness is just another form of division. And God does not want to see us divided. Uh, Satan does. And so unforgiveness is something that if you can identify that it's an issue in your life or with you, it is a first priority step to start working on to help with the healing process. We see that all the time because if you can't forgive, resentment builds up. You can't feel love and joy when you have resentment and unforgiveness in your heart. It's kind of like fight or flight versus rest and digest. They're opposites, they're opposing forces. So they, they can't work together. They can't be in the same room together. Hmm, boy, that's so good. Makes me think of Hebrews 12, 15, look after each other, which again, speaks to the idea of community that love. I mean, you know, a lot of these neuro Christian neuroscientists will say that even the best uh, uh, remedy for healing from trauma is being in a community of people who love you and are going the distance with you, who aren't going to leave the room when the messiest part of you shows up. And this is why, again, why the enemy has leveled so much isolation is because, you know, one of us sends a thousand to flight, two of us sends 10,000 to flight. So the power of yes. our oneness with each other and with God cannot even be quantified. So as we walk with each other and we love each other and we say, I'm not leaving the room when your self life shows, um, that's what helps each other heal. So I love that first part of Hebrews 12, look after each other. So none of you fails to receive the grace of God. And then it says, watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to defile you and corrupt many. So bitterness defiles us and then corrupts many because it doesn't stay static. You can't like walk in a toxic unforgiveness for this person over here and go, but I love the rest of my life over here because in due time, it is like cancer and it'll infiltrate your other relationships. It'll skew how you show up in life and the lens through which you see others. And then it really will affect your immunities and your inflammatory markers and all of those things. So it is so worth, I mean, the scripture is just so, vibrant and powerful and we follow and follow jesus and we do what he says and i mean there is a supernatural healing that does take place in layers but wow well we've already been at it here for an hour and it has just been so awesome so as we get ready to wrap um I wonder if we could talk just one last moment here about just some practical takeaways. So my few practicals are the the three areas of thinking about uh that what happens in your brain when you live love is the joy, the sense of joy and pleasure. And it's a sense of risk. You're willing to risk and the sense of deep attachment. My prayer for you as we go tonight is that you kind of keep those at the forefront of your mind and say, Lord, awaken joy in me. Lord, give me the fire in my belly to take the risks you've put before me. Because that when you step out in faith, I have an intercessor friend who says, God is the one who's responsible for the outcome of your obedience. You know, you obey and God's responsible for the outcome. But to live in the faith zone where you're taking risks that he put before you you're not running hog wild into traffic or you know jumping off a building but you are he might say go on a mission trip or he might say give a certain amount of money to you know a mission that's feeding the poor or whatever but it's risky for you but you engage with god something's going to come alive in you and then attachment that god would help you just see how attached he is that his hold on you is stronger than your hold on him and then i would leave you also with dr kurt thompson's you know three uh pieces of advice for helping the world heal and helping yourself heal and one is 
put yourself in the path of beauty every single day. Be intentional about it. Create something every week and then share the gifts God has given you with someone every week. Maybe you bake cookies and then you give them to the neighbor, but you're in the process of creating, in the process of giving, in the process of beholding. I think these things are super healing and nourishing to the soul, activating to the faith and healing to the world. And, and what about you? Any, any parting advice for our friends tonight? Oh, that, that was brilliant. And I, I would just say having heightened awareness about about those aspects that you just uh, spoke about, just heighten awareness about yourself. Stop, slow down for a little bit and check in. And, and you are 100% right because it really is about us uh, surrendering more and being obedient. And, and we, we tend to take on the weight of the world thinking we have to do everything. And we really don't. We just have to be obedient to God and listen and let God handle the results. And so uh, he gives us good directions when it comes to, to love, um, basically uh, loving each other. And and um, I think it I think it's First uh, John 4 that he says, dear friends, love each other and love is from God. And he talks about is it's you can't get much more clear than that. And so uh, check in, and I'm going to say right now, specifically in this timeline, check in and see where you might be contributing to division versus contributing to loving each other. Uh, loving each other can look different than, than just uh, being nice. You can set boundaries and, and, and um, do other things to, to help, like loving my kids growing up. Uh, there were consequences to bad decisions, yes. Uh, but what does love look like as it, as it relates to loving each other? What, is, what does that look like to you? And even with the, I'm sorry, even with the folks you don't agree with, maybe especially, yeah. you know, I think sometimes we think I'm good, you know, Jesus says, what good is it if you love those who agree with you or think like you, but to walk in love with those who think differently is a great test, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I'm going to read, uh, 1 Corinthians 13 from the Amplified Version, and I'm quite sure I'll get an email because some people don't like the Amplified Version, but I'm, the reason I'm reading is, you know, the Amplified, it, some think they, it's adding to scripture, but basically it's taking key words in the Greek and Hebrew and, and taking those words and adding them into the text. So when you read it, you hear kind of an expanded version. And, you know, it's, it, I would say it's even more than a paraphrased version, but if you want to think of it that way, but I just pray that you'd listen and hear it uh, afresh. If I speak with tongues of men and angels, but have not love for others, growing out of God's love for me, well, then I have become only a noisy gong or clanging cymbal, just an annoying distraction. If I have the gift of prophecy and speak a new message from God to the people and understand all mysteries and possess all knowledge, and if I have all sufficient faith so that I can remove mountains, but I do not have love reaching out to others, I'm nothing. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it does me no good at all. Love endures with patience and serenity. Love is kind and thoughtful. It is not jealous or envious. Love does not brag and it is not proud or arrogant. Love is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not provoked nor overly sensitive or easily angered. It does not take into account a wrong endured. It does not rejoice at injustice, but rejoices when the truth, when the right and the truth prevail. Love bears all things, regardless of what comes. It believes all things, looking for the best in each one, hopes all things, remaining steadfast during difficult times, endures all things without weakening. Love never fails. It never fades nor ends. But as for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for the gift of special knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, for our knowledge is fragmentary, it's incomplete. But when that which is complete and perfect comes, that which is incomplete and partial will pass away. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now, in this time of imperfection, we see in a mirror dimly, a blurred reflection, a riddle, an enigma. But then, when the time of perfection comes, we will see with reality, face to face. Now I know in part, just in fragments. But then, I will know fully, just as I have been fully known by God. I love that. And now there remain faith, 
abiding trust in God and his promises, hope, confident expectation of eternal salvation, and love, unselfish love for others, growing out of God's love for me. These three, the choicest of graces, but the greatest of these is love. I love that. I pray you found some encouragement here tonight. And I just want to remind you again of our great giveaways. Thanks to Synapse, we've got IV therapy. That's $344 value. The Hocket therapy, that's a $344 value. Those, of course, you have to be able to travel to the clinic in Egan, Minnesota to take part. The two gift boxes from Faith Radio, we can send them to you, but it's U.S. residents only. There'll be a link in the chat and you can sign up and register, but you've got a few days to do that. And if you're brand new to the Faith Radio family, we welcome you. We would love to get you a little gift pack of goodies. And so make sure that you register. There's a link in the chat for that as well. Tell us you're new and where you're listening and watching from. We would love to just welcome you to the Faith Radio family. And finally, Dr. Troy, I want to bring your, your mug back on the screen here. Uh, I know you're a busy man, and I just want to say thank you for giving away such valuable time tonight and for helping us really understand what it means to live loved. We sure appreciate you. Oh, I love it. I, I love talking uh, faith and uh, and healing. So thank you very much. I, I appreciate it very much. Yeah. Well, thank you for the way you steward your platform. And thank you for tuning in tonight. I pray you found some encouragement here. Let us know if you'd like us to do more of these. We, you know, I'll just be honest with you behind the scenes, the spiritual warfare leading up to these blows my mind. But then when you get here, you realize why it's so important for us to live loved because the devil hates it. But God loves it. So let's live loved. We'll meet you back here next time.